Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Lead Poisoning 101, Taking Action to Protect Children from Lead. I am really excited that we have Rebecca Munich from the Ecology Center joining us today. Um, and my name is Tracy Gregoire. I'm the LDA's Healthy Children Project Director. So I'm just gonna go over a few housekeeping items as we have more people join us. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. Please type your question into the Q&A um, box and feel free to do that at any point um, during the presentation. Um, and we'll be kind of um, answering those at the end. So you don't have to wait until the end to put your question in. Um, Lauren is our technical guru tonight. If you're having any issues at all, please use the chat box to send her a direct message. Um, unfortunately for those on the phone, we are unable to troubleshoot phone connections at this time. Um, the webinar will be recorded and will be sent to all registrants within 48 hours. Um, and we will also share some helpful links in that email and, and share some of the resources that we'll talk about tonight. Um, so again, thanks for joining us and um, we will get started with the presentation. Um, next slide, please. So just to give a quick overview of the presentation so you know what's coming up, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the Healthy Children Project, a uh, program of LDA and about um, the Ecology Center. We'll cover childhood lead poisoning. We'll talk um, some basics about what is lead. Um, we'll talk about the health effects of the body and um, societal impacts of lead. We'll, of course, talk about preventing lead exposure um, and also go over where we come in contact with lead um, in the home. And then we'll finish up with some resources and some question and answers. And I'd also just like to share that we'll be doing more um, presentations on lead as well to get more into the health impacts. Also talk about lead as, um, as an environmental justice issue. Um, so there'll be more um, webinars to come as well to delve into some of this um, even more. Next slide, please. So um, I'm assuming many of you know what Learning Disabilities Association is. Um, we have LD of America and um, many state affiliates across the United States. You may wonder why LDA is talking about chemicals. Well, the National Academy of Science states that at least a quarter or so of disabilities are linked in whole or in part by environmental factors, including toxic chemical exposures. Um, so if you think about genetics, genetics plays a role, but what might actually flip that light switch or flip that um, disability on for an individual could be a chemical exposure. Um, the good news is that exposures to harmful chemicals is preventable and um, lead poisoning is 100% preventable. Um, LDA's Healthy Children Project translates the scientific evidence on toxic chemicals that harm brain development into education and advocacy um, for folks like all of you um, and our state affiliates, partner groups, policymakers, um, even retailers and the general public and the media. So that's a little bit about um, the Healthy Children Project. Next slide. I will hand it over to um, Becca to talk a little bit about the Ecology Center. Thanks, Tracy. Um, so I'll introduce myself first. I'm Becca Munich. I'm the Deputy Director of the Ecology Center. And we're based in Michigan, but our work is really, you know, spanning national, regional, state issues um, on many different things that touch people's health. So our work is always at the inter intersection of human health and the environment. And what I do is largely in the realm of environmental health and toxics. So protecting kids from lead poisoning or other toxic chemical exposures. So I work really closely with Tracy on these issues and, and the rest of the team um, and other things like PFAS and other chemicals that come up that we're worried about um, the impacts that they have on children's health or people's health generally. On lead poisoning, we've been really focused um, for quite some time at the state level in our home state of Michigan on thinking about what are the, the things that we need to do to reduce children's exposures 
to lead hazards within the home, within communities, within the schools that they, um, they go to school in and things like that. So I um, serve on Michigan's Childhood Lead Elimination Commission. I was appointed by our previous governor and continue to serve now. So working with lawmakers in that way to make sure that we're forwarding best practices in our states. And then I work with a lot of the folks that you're gonna there that are on the panel today, Bev and Diane and Patty and Tracy and others with um, the Great Lakes Lead Elimination Network. And this is a network, a coalition of organizations that are really focused on lead poisoning and children, how do we do more outreach and engagement of families across the country, um, but with a focus, I will say, on the Great Lakes areas um, to really talk about reducing lead exposure and passing policies to protect kids from lead um, and things along those lines. So I'm really excited to be with you here today. Um, you know, we share that same focus uh, with the Healthy Children's Project of LDA on really looking at the intersection between children's health and environmental issues like lead poisoning. So thanks for having me. Um, so I'm gonna start with a story. And this is not a real person, Lashana, I'll mention that. Um, it is something that we, um, working with our partners at Wayne State University and their D-LED project, which is a number of families that have been impacted by lead poisoning. Um, we, we have a, we pulled together a number of different pieces of stories to, to put this fictional story together to give you a sense of it. So Lashana, in this case, is a three-year-old girl who lives in Detroit in an older home built in the 40s. Her house had, has old windows and doors and an old porch. Um, if you walk around the house, you're gonna see, unfortunately, chipping and peeling paint on the window wells and doors because it's an old home and maybe there's been some moisture in the home that's come from the leaky roof that happened quite some time ago um, and wasn't patched immediately. So Lashana loves to look out the window and play outside her toy, play with her toys in the windowsill. Um, she, like most children who are little, put everything in their mouth. Um, this is how kids explore their world. So she's putting hands or fingers or, um, and her toys in her mouth um, all the time. Um, when she was a baby, her parents wanted to paint her room and they unknowingly scraped off the paint off the walls, which had lead paint in it, um, and left lead dust on the floor. She wasn't tested, um, for lead in her blood, um, for, until she was three years old. Um, although she should have been tested at one and two years of age, um, COVID put the kibosh on that and a lot of um, families weren't able to make it into their well child visits at those times. She now, now has a high lead level of 25, what's called micrograms per deciliter. The action level, so when you're supposed to take action according to the Center for Disease Control um, across the United States is at 4.5 micrograms per deciliter. So you can see 25 is pretty darn high and it's very dangerous. So if her lead levels continue to go up, she may even have to go into the hospital for treatment. But right now, her parents are learning about lead poisoning and are learning about what they can do in terms of cleaning the house week weekly, improving the house, making sure that when they do future renovations, they are done in a lead safe way. Um, so her lead levels come down. The parents are also becoming advocates in the D-LED group in Detroit, Michigan, and are helping to make local laws and state laws stronger and better enforced to protect kids like Lashana. And the reason we start with a story like this is oftentimes when we dive into facts and figures about um, health impacts, we forget that there are real, you all don't forget this, there are real people behind the stories. Um, and so even though Lashana is a fictional character, um, these are parts of people's stories that they've lived in the Detroit community and that many folks that you've encountered, maybe even yourselves, um, have, have dealt with with lead poisoning. Um, so we want to just put a face on this and make sure that, you know, we're thinking about children like Lashana as we go through this presentation. Tracy, I think this is back to you. Thanks, Becca. So let's talk a little bit about what is lead, right? A lot of us know there is no safe level of exposure to lead, but what is it? Lead, um, like some other heavy metals, um, is naturally occurring in the earth. Um, lead is poisonous, right? It is harmful and it impacts both the brain and the nervous system. 
Um, lead poisoning is irreversible, but the good news is it is completely preventable. Next slide. So let's um, talk about a little bit about um, the health um, um, costs of lead. So there are many health impacts of lead. As I said, there's no safe level of lead exposure for a child or even an adult. Um, once lead enters the body, it's distributed to the organs, um, such as the brain and liver, and um, as well as the bones. Um, lead um, is stored in the bones and the teeth, and it um, accumulates over time in the bone and the teeth. Um, but unfortunately, it can be remobilized or released um, into the blood during pregnancy, which exposes um, the fetus. Um, um, a lot of you won't be surprised about this, but lead um, does or uh, can harm the brain and nervous system, le leading to lasting developmental and health um, challenges. Next slide, please. So what are some of the specific um, health impacts um, um, or disabilities that can be related to lead? In young children, um, learning disabilities um, and decreased or lower IQ, ADHD and behavioral issues like um, um, for children, um, but also calcium deficiency, which is one that folks might not be as aware of. In adults and children, some health impacts include osteoporosis, which is the thinning of the bones, um, permanent harm to the brain, kidneys, bones, and heart, um, anemia, um, reproductive issues, um, and um, challenges like reduced problem solving skills. And um, even though they're not listed here, some other health effects um, include hypertension, hearing loss, um, Parkinson's, social and behavioral challenges. Um, so again, can um, impact people, um, be lifelong impacts for folks. Next slide, please. So what happens when lead enters the body? Um, um, with, with many chemicals, we know that the pregnant mother's exposure um, is also the, the fetus's exposure and with breastfeeding, also the um, infant's exposure. Um, so unfortunately, lead can be passed from a pregnant um, mother to the fetus or young child. Um, lead is stored for long periods of times in the body um, and the teeth and the bones. But it's also important to note that lead can be released um, from the teeth and bones when the body doesn't get enough minerals like calcium and iron. Um, so this is where the um, nutrition of the mother becomes really important during pregnancy and, and breastfeeding because you don't want that lead that's stored in the mother's um, bones or teeth to be released and then um, impact the, the child. Um, because there are often no visible effects from lead exposure, we need to test in order to determine um, the blood uh, lead level, which is why it is so critical um, to test young children for lead. Next slide, please. So some of the um, other societal impacts that folks might not be as aware of. Um, LDA talks a lot about the pipeline to prison, um, lead is a double whammy because it can both cause um, aggression and other challenges um, and um, um, in one, so for example, in one um, self-reported study, uh, over 40% of inmates reported a disability um, with a learning disability being the most common disability. So a lot of people in prison, right, um, are, are partly there because they didn't get the services and support that they needed when they were younger. But lead is also linked to aggression and other behaviors, right? Um, that can then lead to um, um, juvenile delinquency. So an estimated 10% of juvenile delinquency is attributed to lead poisoning. Um, so if you think about um, the kids who are getting in trouble and um, committing crimes, 10% um, is a significant amount and you know that lead poisoning right is again preventable um, just to give one example in 2014 in michigan there were about um, 214,000 um, reported crimes and almost um, 
6,600 of those were linked to childhood lead exposure. Next slide, please. I think this is me. Um, so this is a uh, some information that has come out about racial disparities in lead. And as Tracy said, um, we want to be able to dig into this um, in more depth and do a full presentation about lead as an environmental justice issue, um, because it's it's really important to think about how it disproportionately impacts um, people of different racial identities and ethnicities, um, socioeconomic um, classes, and things along those lines. Um, so briefly, uh, this is a study um, that the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Pew Charitable Trust to the figure here that you can see um, put together in 2019. And there are a number of other studies, even this year, 2020 and 2021, that have shown that um, Black children um, in particular, and to a lesser extent, um, Hispanic children have elevated blood lead levels at a higher rate than white children across the United States. So this is a, these are national studies um, and some of them do various analyses of, again, that national data, um, NHANES, which is the National Health and Nutrition um, data. So children in low income households are also more likely to be poisoned by lead and children particularly that are in rental homes are more frequently, and we've seen this in Michigan where I'm at, uh, but in other areas as well, are also more likely to be impacted by lead. And that's likely because um, some in lower income areas, um, in rental areas, there may not be the same maintenance and upkeep on how homes, particularly in low income areas, um, that, that are done by owner occupied home owners um, instead of landlords. Um, so you can see there that even um, it, that in households, 28% um, of black households and 29% of low income households um, face that that household related child lead exposure versus 20% of white and 18% of wealthier households. So you may live in an old home that has lead paint on the walls, but if you keep it you know, sealed in with fresh coats of paint, if it's not chipping and peeling, and we'll talk about the routes of exposure here in a little bit, um, you can prevent actually having a child be exposed to lead in that way. And so there's part of the reason why there's an income disparity there. Um, and then, so diving into that, um, I'm going to focus mostly on the home today. I'm happy to provide information and talk about some other things like where lead can be found in consumer products or in food and in spices and things like that. But the main routes of exposure are really going to be coming from certain areas around our home. Um, lead paint on the walls, uh, interior and exterior of a home. Lead in water, as we know, um, and again, in my home state from the Flint water crisis, and now, unfortunately, another community in Benton Harbor, Michigan, another um, majority minority community, Black community in the state that has elevated levels of lead in their drinking water, um, and then also in our soil. Um, and so I'm going to dive into those areas more um, here, but know that lead can still be found, unfortunately, in a number of consumer products like lipstick. When you look at the cosmetics piece over here, um, food, foodware and spices, um, a number of studies have come out in terms of like turmeric um, having high levels of lead in it. So otherwise a very healthy spice when we think of it that way. Um, and then other things like jewelry and high levels of lead that can be found in costume jewelry and things like that, cheap jewelry that we might find. Now we do have some laws um, at the federal level, the Consumer Products Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act of 2008 did set uh, lower levels for lead in a number of children's products, which is really good, um, but there's more work to be done. Um, but that is another presentation. So when we think about the home in particular, um, I can figure out how to move my slides. Uh, the first place that we want to focus is really about lead paint. Um, Lead paint was allowed in the United States in housing um, until 1978. And the reason it was used is because it makes your paint really, your whites very bright, your white paint, and it had all these really good material properties, right? It was great in terms of painting. Um, unfortunately, 
And it was, it's not great in terms of when it comes off because paint chips and peels and things like that, we all know this. Um, it's not, it's very detrimental to children. Um, so unfortunately in some communities you have really old housing stocks. Um, so over 70% in my home state of Michigan of houses are pre-1978, so they're older homes, both in rural and urban areas. Um, we've got maps that we're happy to share um, from different communities um, where you actually can see it's sort of um, a number of children are, are impacted everywhere. And that's largely because the housing stock um, is older in certain areas and certain states in particular. And the, East Coast in the Midwest um, in certain parts of, of California and other West Coast states. Um, so as you can see here, um, we've got the picture of my colleague's son in the windowsill and there's some chipping paint there. He knows, uh, he's, you can see he's got some gloves on there so he knows not to put his hands in his mouth and his mom was very keen on that but he crawled up in the window there. And with windows and doors and places like that, you have a lot of friction which causes the lead to chip off. Um, and so that's that's a problem in a lot of older homes. You can see right below him in the picture um, is just what the peeling paint might look like um, in a particular place. And in these other pictures, and I'll show the examples here, um, we know that it doesn't take very much lead contaminated dust uh, to, to poison a child. Unfortunately, just this teeny tiny amount, and also in the picture there, um, is the amount of lead contaminated dust um, from lead paint that it would take to contaminate a 1500 square foot home. So it's not much. Um, and this is why it's really important for us to think about um, what are the different things that we can do to make sure we're encapsulating the paint, um, that we're cleaning properly and things like that. And then in the middle there, you'll see lead check swabs. These are what we offer to families that we work with in our uh, in-person um, and now virtual training programs in Michigan uh, to do lead dust tests um, within their home. And so this is a good brand here. Wanted to make sure folks saw that. Um, you can have professionals called lead inspector risk, assessor, risk assessors come out. Uh, it's about, in Michigan, it's about $500 um, for an average home to do that, that specific testing and inspection for lead risks. Um, so if you live in an older home and you're concerned because you of uh, the chipping and peeling paint, I would encourage you um, to look into resources in, in your neck of the woods. A lot of resources, and we've got some of these things later um, from the EPA, you can find out or your local, um, your state health department might have resources of who you can call. So soil is another place that is important to consider in terms of exposure. And there's the, the same similar story with leaded gasoline that actually was used uh, in cars all the way up until 1996. It was finally banned from cars. It was phased out earlier than that in a lot of different um, automobiles in the, the late 70s and 80s, um, but it was still technically allowed to be used and you would still see, folks probably remember, leaded and unleaded gas um, pumps um, for quite some time. And the problem is that lead is very heavy, right? It's a heavy metal. And so it comes out of the tailpipe of a car or it did in the past and it doesn't um, go away, it lands on the soil. And that's why you have, particularly along highways and heavily trafficked roads and older communities, you may have more lead in the soil. You also get lead um, that comes off of the exterior paint on a home that, lend, that is in what's called the drip line. So where the rain drips um, off of the home and the soil around there. So it's very important that um, when there may be lead either due to um, the drip line of a home, if a home was previously painted with lead paint because it's an older home or because you're along a busy area um, of highway or a neighborhood that has a lot of traffic or previously did, um, that you're covering that soil, that you're not leaving it exposed um, so kids can get it. So you can cover it with a heavy layer of mulch or grass or things like that. Um, you should not be growing food um, in directly in that soil. You should put a raised bed and bring in clean soil. Um, and then you should make sure that you're washing any toys and kids' hands if they're going outside and they're playing um, frequently to reduce their exposure from lead. Um, and then also 
Uh, simple tips to take your shoes off when you come in homes, um, because a lot of times uh, the lead in the soil might be on your shoes in addition to other things like pesticides um, that might be on, on lawns and gardens. And you just don't wanna bring that into the home, if, particularly if you have little kids crawling around um, and living a lot closer to the floor than we do as adults. So lead in water um, is another area I wanna focus on. And this is something that's really interesting um, right now because there's a tremendous amount of money that has been appropriated or that has been approved and in the infrastructure package that just happened federally and in the COVID recovery funds previously uh, this year to address lead service lines or lead pipes. And that's really important. Um, in Michigan, we just had a bill passed through our Senate here in the state to appropriate $1 billion of funding to remove lead service lines in our state. And that is terrific news and we need to do so. We have quite a bit of older pipes there. Um, so lead can come into the water because of the plumbing, right? So the lead service lines are, are the what comes in from the street and that's typically where you're going to, they're made of entirely of lead, um, and you're going to see lead come out of the water if you don't have the right mix of chemicals, good chemicals in this case, to prevent corrosion in the pipes. Um, unfortunately, if the water is sticking around for a long time in the pipes, those corrosion control chemicals stop being effective. And this is actually what happens, tends to happen in schools or childcare facilities that don't have water running through them all day, every day, you know, have long breaks over the weekends, um, have long breaks over different holiday breaks and things like that. And you can have more lead come out into the water or leach into the water from those. It's important to know that boiling water does not lower the level of lead in the water. Um, unfortunately, actually concentrates the percentage of lead in the water because the water is boiled away, not the lead. Um, you can, however, add a filter to your kitchen faucet to help remove lead from your drinking water. And there are lots of different filters. They're relatively inexpensive, or you can even get the pitchers, um, you know, by, I'm not Brita or something or Pure or those various water pitchers that you can use um, to filter lead out. Make sure that the filter included in it um, is certified um, and we'll, we'll send you this information. NSF 53 is the certification to remove lead. Um, I can chat that out in a bit. And then also flushing the water out of the system. If it's been overnight, if it's hanging around in your pipes, um, let the water run for a few minutes. If you have a house with older plumbing before you, you're cooking, drinking, or making any bottles for children um, to help flush that lead out. Again, lead is heavy and so it will move out, um, but you need to make sure you're moving it through the system um, if you don't yet have a filter or if your lead service lines have not been removed in your community yet. So we talked a lot about some of the societal impacts and the health impacts. And I think that's incredibly important because that's the, the moral argument of this, right? It's important to protect our children to make sure that um, they have every opportunity to be successful and healthy and live healthy and active lives. Um, but there's a dollar and cent cost to um, not addressing lead poisoning across the country. And this is something that with when I talk with lawmakers in my state or at the federal government, sometimes um, some folks want to know how much, what is the actual financial impact of not addressing lead poisoning when we're asking for lots of money to make sure we're abating homes or removing lead hazards from homes or moving lead service lines and things like that. So, oops. There's a terrific website that I encourage you to look at. I've got a Michigan and a California example here, but valueoflead.prevention.org. And you can click on the map that comes up on this website and you can look at your state's information and um, you can see what the private costs are. So those are the costs that are borne by folks like you and I um, in your state for the entire population. You can look at the federal, which I believe is, is this pink 
um, color here, and then the state and local budgets, which is the yellow bar over here. You can see the number of children that are estimated to be exposed to lead um, in your particular state, and then what that total cost is, the economic burden. Um, and a large portion of that cost is lost lifetime earnings. Because lead affects children's nervous system and brains, um, and is linked to um, lower IQ levels and things like that, challenges um, with learning and, and, um, and success in schools, um, children who have elevated blood lead levels tend to have a lower lifetime earnings potential than children who don't. There are things that you can do, but prevention is really going to be the key thing um, to make sure that, that kids are protected in the first place. So it is the most cost-effective solution to prevent lead exposures um, in the first place. We talked a little bit of already about removing lead from a home, so abatement or remediation, um, in particularly those homes that are older, focusing on rental housing, um, and there are quite a few financial resources that are coming again from the COVID recovery funds and the infrastructure package that just got passed through the federal government to our states and our communities. So local and state governments have a tremendous amount of resources, perhaps you know more than they've had in my lifetime um, to address these issues. And so um, I know Bev and others who are on the panel have been advocating for those dollars to be used to protect children. Um, and so we can help you do that in your, in your neck of the woods too. Um, relocation is also uh, an important thing to consider. And there are some pilot studies happening right now in Michigan um, with our partners at Wayne State University in Detroit to look at either temporary, uh, providing um, a temporary relocation of families when a child has a very high blood lead level of 40 micrograms per deciliter. Um, so again, think of that, it's almost 10 times the action level at the national level. And that child needs to get out of that home as soon as possible so they do not continue to be exposed to lead. So making sure that they have a, a lead safe home to go to um, while that home they're, that they lived in before um, is being remediated is critically important. And then sometimes it's just the best idea to, to move to a safer home. And if a family is open to that, making sure there are options for permanent location um, in different communities for families to go to affordable homes um, that have already been proved to be lead safe. You can also see additional information and strategies um, both on the EPA and then I put our Michigan um, information here we've done even though the, some of the strategies are, are, even though it's a state level uh, website, there's the strategies would be universal. And so I just wanted to highlight those there. And we have more resources in just a few minutes. Um, so a little bit more on prevention. Um, we talked a bit about testing homes, um, or no, we haven't talked about testing. Oh, we did, sorry. Um, I mentioned those lead inspector risk assessors that can come and they can test in your home for lead. And if you have an older home that is built pre-1978, this is something you might, and you have young children coming into the home, this is something you might consider doing. Um, make sure that all of the paint in your home, if that's the case, is in good condition, not chipping or peeling. Um, you know, making sure you're using lead safe work practices if you're doing any remodeling of the home or any renovation um, to, that might disturb the paint. Um, there are different uh, resources available both on the EPA's website, often even in your Lowe's and Home Depot that will have lead safe um, materials that are right there um, in the painting section that you, can, that you can take and look at that information. If, make sure that you're using wet cleaning, so not dry dusting um, of your, your surfaces. Um, weekly is suggested or as often as you possibly can, especially those window sills and wells. Again, the friction from a window is going to, if it's painted with lead-based paint um, and you find that out because you've tested, um, you wanna make sure that you're wiping those down so kids aren't exposed to the dust. And then if you can, using a HEPA filter on your vacuum, if you don't have 
that, making sure you're misting your carpet, just with a spray bottle of water before you vacuum is gonna help keep that lead dust down um, and prevent it from coming out of the vacuum um, and recontaminating the carpet. And then washing kids' hands and toys often, taking shoes off at the door, things along those lines will go pretty far to reduce children's exposure to lead. Um, Tracy, I don't remember who was gonna dive into this one, but I'm happy to start us off and, and if there's anything you wanna add. Sure. Okay. Um, so we're going to have our information up here in a moment, but definitely stay connected with, with myself, with Tracy, and with others, um, and learn more about lead. Uh, we have a number of resources in a moment that we'll share with you. Happy to connect via email to um, answer any questions that we can't get to today. I think, I hope we have enough time that we can answer all of your questions as well. Um, there are a number of different state policies and local ordinances. If, again, if you're located in the Great Lakes area, uh, we're focused there right now in any Great Lakes state, um, do reach out to me or Tracy and let us know um, where you're at. We can also connect you if you're not, we can try to connect you with some of the national organizations like National Center for Healthy Homes um, or perhaps some other local organizations that we know of in your states. Um, so that you know what's moving with state and local policies and ordinances related to lead. Um, advocate for that funding of lead cleanup in homes and removal of lead pipes. As I mentioned, there's a lot of money that's just come to different two communities and to states all across the country from the federal government. So now is the time to be making sure that your communities and your states are using that funding. And then take the tools that you're learning here today and we'll, we'll share this PowerPoint, uh, the PowerPoint slides with you to continue to educate your family, your community about what you can do to reduce lead exposure. Um, and then if you have little kids in your life, make sure they're getting their blood lead tests. We recommend universal testing for all children, at least at one and two years of age. And really, if you can, every year up to six years of age. Lead doesn't stick around, so to speak, in the blood for very long. It can, it, as Tracy mentioned, can move into the bones. And so it's important to test more than once um, and at a frequent level, especially if you're moving to a new home or grandma moves to a new home or something like that, um, to make sure that, that your, um, your children are protected and things along those lines. Tracy, what did I miss here? Anything? I think that was a, a great overview, um, you know, like obviously the child's nutrition, but also the pregnant mom's nutrition, right, is, is, is really important. Um, and we know that that can also be like a factor for, um, in addition to genetics and other things for learning disabilities, so I think yeah. it's really important. Um, to think, think about I, I those think things. I missed that slide somehow, because <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah, and, um, I, and, and LDA also talks about like how some of these heavy metals, including lead, mercury, cadmium, um, arsenic are, you know, also found in baby foods and fruits and vegetables. So LDA has resources about how to look at your diet and to um, like things like rice cereal for babies, avoiding rice cereal because that's more likely to have arsenic. It's a different heavy metal, but when you think about the impacts on children, you can have a lead safe level or a lead action level for lead, right? But that doesn't account for other heavy metals and other chemicals that children are exposed to, including neurotoxins um, that can also impact a child. So, um, you know, we have a lot of those resources as well. Um, you know, whether it's diet or products or things like how can you um, do the best to protect your family. Um, but I think the ultimate goal, right, um, and why LD is working on this in the Ecology Center and lots of partners is because, right, every child, every school, every daycare, every place should be safe for all children, right? We need funding to um, prevent um, lead poisoning and also for abatement. But we also be, need to be looking about the, look at the other sources of these chemicals and how to make sure we're protecting all children. So that's the ultimate goal, and that's where we encourage um, folks to 
join us and right take action because um, together we can um, make change more quickly. So that's the exciting part is we want to let you all know how to protect your children now, but also ways to, to take action. So, um, you know, we'll end um, with some ways to take action and then some resources, um, staying connected with us, right? Most of you probably have an active LDA affiliate in your state. Um, there are a number of affiliates on the call today. Um, including Illinois and Wisconsin and, um, you know, um, Indiana and Texas and others that are, we're doing this work together and working with partners like Becca to bring you these kinds of uh, webinars. So staying connected with us, um, supporting local and state policies. So a local policy might be an ordinance that talks about lead abatement and talks about how to make sure apartment buildings are safe and what to do. Um, um, with, with homes that have lead, lead problems. Um, advocating for funding for cleanup um, and removal of lead pipes because, you know, we can't all filter our water or drink um, bottled water, which has other issues, right? We need to like deal with the source of the lead. Um, educating community about reducing lead exposure. Like I often ask people to do a letter to the editor and, or an op-ed or, or contact, um, um, policymakers to share your story about why this is really important. Um, and of course, making sure that young children get blood um, lead tests. Um, and I know my son was tested once. I don't know that he was tested twice, right? And I do this work. So it's, it's you know, it's one of those things to help remind other families to, to do that testing and make sure children are okay. Um, but there are lots of ways to get involved um, that are really simple and easy to plug in. So please stay connected with us and we will help plug you into those opportunities. Um, and then just before we go to questions, um, some resources, and I will uh, make sure that with the recording and a PDF of the slides, we also have links, because I know um, it's hard to scramble down these links, but Ecology Center um, has some great resources, Healthy Children Project, it's a whole program of LDA. We have our own website, because there's so much information. Um, you know, we have, you know, fact sheets, um, you know, on, on lead and infographics and things that are easy to share. Um, like I said, a lot of you have state affiliates in, in your own state. Um, and there's also our email addresses um, as well. So we'll make sure that those links go and that um, post email that will go out in the next 48 hours along with the recording and PDF of the slides. So now we would love to um, entertain some questions. And I think Lauren is going to help feed those questions to us. Yeah, so just a reminder, everybody, if you could put your questions in the Q&A section, um, we can find them more easily here. But we do have a couple of questions a while. Um, so the first one here is, are schools and daycare child care centers able to get information about the children's lead levels at the time of enrollment? Or is this protected by HIPAA? That's a really good question. Um, and I don't know if laws are different in different states. Um, I do know that there's some information that is, um, that, um, well, maybe schools, I don't know about daycare and childcare facilities, but if they are educational institutions in Michigan, um, that information is um, passed along, particularly when you have programs like we have here, Head Start or Early Start programs, early childhood education. Um, so that the educators um, are aware of that. So um, it, the HIPAA laws are a little bit, I'm, I'm not as clear on how they would work with daycare and child care centers if they aren't officially um, educational centers. Um, you know what I mean? And some are licensed and some are unlicensed, at least here in Michigan. And I think the state laws may be different elsewhere. All right, that sounds good. Um, we have one more question here so far, um, and it is about what is um, about uh, water coming in from wells, as in common in rural Michigan. I know we were talking about um, using different water filters and things um, as lead stays in the water. Is that also something that's common with wells? Um, it would be less common unless you have a lead service line from your well. It's not actually in the well itself, the well water. It's really in the plumbing materials. So plumbing, um, fun fact, is, you know, <laughs> is 
ha has that PB, which is actually the sign, the chemical sign for lead in the periodic table of elements. And so back in, you know, Roman, ancient Roman times, they used to use lead for their plumbing. So it's really thinking about the pipe. So it could come into your home um, if you have an old lead service line from your well or just in the lead solder um, and anything in the fixtures, brass fixtures that had higher levels of lead in them. So if you're on well water, it's not that you're not uh, likely to, that there may not be any lead problem, um, but it is a little bit different. So I'd encourage you, you can get your lead tested pretty inexpensively. You mentioned in Michigan, um, look at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, um, go to their website um, and just type in uh, lead and water testing and, and you can learn a little bit more about getting that tested. Every state has different rules. In Michigan, again, we have um, testing that's being done in municipal water systems. So if you're connected to a city system, that testing is happening um, through our new lead and copper rule that was revised after the Flint water crisis. There are, there's the federal lead and copper rule where that testing um, is supposed to happen as well. Um, but different states have different rules and policies. And this is why it's really important going back to the what you can do to make sure that we're pushing because sometimes the states can move faster than the federal government for local and state level policies that are more protective of, of kids. Definitely. So we have another question here. Um, I know we had said before that lead poisoning can be irreversible. The easiest thing to do is prevention. Um, but the question here is what type of treatment is available for those who have been exposed, such as to reverse the effects of lead poisoning? Um, Tracy, happen whenever you want, but I'm, I'm just going to keep rolling with these for a while. <laughs> uh, so unless a child um, or an adult has very high levels of lead, again, that 40, 45 micrograms per deciliter and up, there isn't a medical treatment. At that very, very high level, there's a process called chelation. However, at lower levels of um, lead in the blood, it is actually very dangerous and it is counterindicated. It is not recommended to chelate a person, a child or adult or otherwise, if their blood level, blood lead level is under that 40 micrograms per deciliter, it can do more harm than good. Um, but there are things that you can do to mitigate the impacts of lead. Um, so that slide, let me see if I can go back to it, a couple of slides ago on nutrition. There we go. Um, so making sure that an adult or a child has an adequate level of calcium in their diet is really important. So we talked a lot about bones, red teeth, right? That lead deposits there. And that's because lead looks into the body a lot like calcium. And unfortunately, calcium can adhere to your bones and to your teeth, or sorry, lead can adhere to your bones and your teeth instead of calcium, which leads to those later in life um, issues like osteoporosis um, and thinning of the bones and things like that in adults, um, and that concentration of lead in the bones and the teeth. So making sure you have adequate levels of calcium in your diet will prevent lead from, it'll make sure that the lead doesn't um, deposit into your bones and actually it's just flushed out of your system. Again, lead doesn't stick around in the blood. What's called its half-life is, is quite short. Um, so you can make sure you're, um, you have your calcium, your vitamin C and your iron and other things like that. So that if it's a child or an adult, they're not necessarily holding on to that lead in their body. Um, so those are some of the things that you can do um, to prevent lead exposures or to prevent worse impacts from an exposure to lead. Another thing that's really important for young children, and I think this is true of many different uh, learning disabilities, is making sure they have access to high quality early education. And this can really give a kid the head start they need to overcome any challenges they might have um, with, uh, with a learning disability associated with lead poisoning or things along those lines. So that's, that's critical, making sure you've got um, early preschool that's well-funded, uh, that's accessible to kids across you know, your communities and your states. 
We have another question here. Uh, does lead poisoning affect adults in the same way that it affects children? The conversation around lead poisoning has focused on children, but is, it, uh, is this a serious of an issue for adults? Um, go ahead, Tracy. Do you want to hop in? Yeah, we talked a little bit about this and we can cover it more, I think, in more detail in, in a, a, another webinar. But yes, like there are some different effects and also, right, early life exposure, right, having impacts later in life for adults. So there, we often say there is no safe level of lead, right? That goes for adults as well as children, right? There is an impact. So osteoporosis, the thinning of the bones later in life because of the storing of you know, lead in the bones and in the teeth, um, right? Issues um, like permanent harm or issues with the kidneys, the brain, the heart, anemia, reproductive issues. Um, so yeah, there are some different um, effects or, or you know, effects that might not show until later on in life from lead exposure. And a lot of the exposures in adults, and there's some information on um, this, website that we have here somewhere. Sorry. Um, this one that's lift um, resources, there's adult exposure and occupational exposure. So you can be exposed at your job. Let's say you're a contractor and you're renovating homes and you're exposed to lead that way. Or you work in an industry where lead is used um, and you're soldering things with lead or something along those lines. That can be a source of lead exposure for adults. Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe you have particular hobbies. Maybe you're making your own fishing lures and unfortunately there's a lot of lead in there. And so the impacts in adults can be, like Tracy said, they, some of them are very similar and some can be a little bit different. Um, typically they don't show up at the low levels that we might see with children because adults' brains are already formed. Their brains and their nervous systems and all in a lot of your bodily systems through, you know, in utero and up through adolescence, they're changing so rapidly that lead's impacts can be elevated in that period of time, but they still are problematic and harmful for adults. And that you know, we don't wanna see that exposure in anyone, but we do focus on kids a lot just because they're at such a vulnerable stage in their lives. Definitely. Um, so we have another question here. I know we talked about um, how lead can have an effect on behavior issues and a lot on the brain. Um, but this question is asking, are there any outward signs of symptoms of lead poisoning? Not really, not um, unless you really think of the behavioral ones that might ring a bell. But unfortunately, um, that, you know, reduced um, uh, impulse control, hyperactivity, increased aggression, those things often will show up later and the damage has been done. The exposure to lead might have happened years prior to that. Um, it may still be ongoing, um, but it's a little bit more challenging to actually to, to know when it's happening in a you know, young child or an infant. So that's why those tests are so important to do on an annual basis, particularly with babies and toddlers. Um, so you're finding out if they have if they have lead in their blood. Right, and certainly testing, you know, more than once. And we've heard, you know, LDA members say, you know, I went and asked my doctor later, right? Oh, was my child tested? And they were like, oh, you were not in the priority area where like we know there's all of this uh, older housing. Um, that's not okay. Like really, I mean, parents, and guardians need to advocate for testing, but really they should be testing all children, right? Again, you just don't know where that child might be exposed. It could be in the home, it could be in the childcare, it could be in the family's home, it could be right in school, but um, really you need to test all kids and test them at least, you know, ideally a couple of times, right? Because you might not see, you know, immediate health effects, but if you know if you test, you know, there's a problem, right? You can then find what the source of the lead is and, you know, get those levels down. So we really encourage, you know, people to like get tested and advocate, you know, to get children in your lives tested um, so that we can prevent that lead poisoning. 
Definitely. Well, and Tracy, this one kind of builds off of what you were just saying. Um, how would you suggest to go about advocating for testing, for early testing for lead? I mean, when you go in and you're um, right for those check checkups, uh, I know with COVID, it's you know been a little bit harder. And you know, another concern with COVID is like kids not getting that testing or getting right um, the healthcare, in-person healthcare that they really need. Um, but you know, asking, you know, when do you, you know, like I've read, like ideally, you know, I have my child tested at once and then tested again in those early years. Um, and ask for that lead test. And even if they say, oh, you know, you're not in an area where we're really concerned about, say, you know, as, as a parent, I, I want to get my child tested to make sure, right, there is um, not any lead exposure, right? That's the only way to, to know for sure. So I, I think you have to, you know, ask for it if it's not being offered. I think that's right. And it, folks should know there's two types of um, blood lead tests and uh -huh. one is a mostly like a, a finger prick or a heel prick test for little children little babies um, and that's really quick and it's inexpensive um, unfortunately there has been a recall in some of the machines that do that so that might be a little bit more difficult or there's a, a draw from a vein a, a venous draw test and that usually you do have to go to a laboratory that does that blood work um, for your kid to be tested that way um, but a lot of places, uh, different clinics and places like that will do those, those quicker, less expensive tests. And if they're negative, that's good. If they're positive, you should go for a follow-up uh, blood draw test. That sounds good. Um, so many older homes with cracked and chipping paint also have radiators that were painted with lead paint. Uh, how do you recommend dealing with the radiators? That's a good question. Uh, I am not sure. I don't know enough about radiators to know if you can paint safely over radiators and how to do that. Um, but I'll do a little research there. I'm assuming you would want to, um, like with walls, paint over them um, and however that would be safely done. You don't wanna remove the paint. Uh, keeping it in place and encapsulating it or sealing it in is usually the best way to go. And we have a question here asking, um, have there been any studies that we could maybe provide in a link um, with the email um, about the link between uh, criminal behavior and lead poisoning? Yes, there have been a number of studies and we're happy to send some of those links over. You can definitely include that in our email that goes out. Um, I think that may be all the questions we have. I see a question um, or a comment here about making sure information is accessible, particularly if folks don't have access to technology. And, and I couldn't agree with you more, um, making sure that you know you have materials that are available in health clinics. I was just talking um, with someone who works in a clinic in Southwest Detroit today um, and asking what kind of materials they have in the clinic. And, how can we make sure they're there in a printed form? They're in whatever, this is a clinic that serves the Latino community so that they're in Spanish and English or whatever language um, is spoken in the area. Very important. Okay. Well, thank you, Becca, for, for joining us today for this presentation. Um, like I said, we will send out the resources and the recording and the PDF of the slides and be doing more um, webinars on lead and delving in a little bit more to health impacts to, you know, how um, we can be more engaged, right, and prevent lead poisoning. So um, we will definitely share, um, you know, those upcoming webinars as we schedule them as well. But thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you, Becca, for co-presenting with me. Thanks for having me. And it was nice chatting with you all. And I look forward to the session base again.